everyone. Welcome back to our series on the most important battles in the Civil War. In the last episode, we looked at the Battle of Fredericksburg. The Union suffered a humiliating loss. McClellan, the general, had been swapped out for another general, Burnside, who in turn was swapped out with Hooker. So the Union is really entering its low point. It's sort of like Britain after Dunkirk in World War II before it's able to start to go on the offensive. So things are going poorly for the Union. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the next stage in the Civil War with Chancellorsville. But before we do that, we want to do a brief excursus and look at Civil War medicine and disease. And I think this is a good topic because when you see pictures of the Civil War, a lot of times it's a group of soldiers standing together looking stony-faced at the camera. But if you ever see camps or injured soldiers... It doesn't look like what you would see in World War II with a military hospital or men lying in beds. It looks like something like a refugee camp in a war zone when people have bandages, they have their arms in slings. It looks like all this impromptu medicine, and it looks much more horrific than what you would see in other wars. So I thought this is good to examine because this also leads to a lot of death among soldiers. They might have a small battlefield wound, but that turns into something that ultimately results into a fatality. So... James, tell us a little bit about this. Uh, why is the Civil War such a destructive conflict beyond the tactics that are outdated compared to the weaponry available? Very simply, the science of killing had far advanced the science of healing. I've heard it said, I don't know, what, I've listened to so many um, lectures and audiobooks and podcasts and stuff, but somebody s said it really well. They said that the Civil War was the period, it was basically the coming to the end of the medical middle ages huh. uh it's we're, we're going to see some major developments in medicine in the late 1800s but we're just in the twilight of the period where if you were shot during the civil war your treatment would be not all that different from being shot let's say during the i don't know revolutionary war or we can even go further back 30 years war we can even go back to the 100 years war it just People didn't understand a lot of things that we understand now that were realized in the late, very late 1800s. First of all, I want to talk about the mini balls. We talked several episodes ago about the type of weaponry that was used in the Civil War. And we talked about how most infantry soldiers on both sides used rifled muskets. And a rifled musket is able to put a spin on a bullet and it's more accurate and it's more deadly and you can shoot from a much longer distance. Um, the main bullet was called a mini ball. It was named after a French uh, infantry officer named Jean. I think it was Jean-Claude Minier. I don't know if you don't know a French person's name, just say Jean-Claude and you're probably okay. <laughs> um, or Pierre. But um, anyway, but we just called it mini balls. It, it's an Anglic anglicized version of the name, but the mini ball was very thick and when it came out of the muzzle of the rifle, it had a relatively low muzzle velocity, meaning it just it wasn't anywhere near as fast as modern weapons or even World War II weapons. Um, and so these things were relatively slow moving, and they would, when they went into your body, especially if they went into a limb, if you think about, if you were shot today in the arm, the bullet will go through, it'll usually go in and out really fast. It might clip uh, a blood vessel, it might clip a bone, but it's really quick. But these were much slower, and so they would get into your arm and they would crush the bone, they would shatter bones, they would rattle around, tearing up flesh, tearing up blood vessels. And so the overwhelming majority of the time that any soldier was shot in a limb, either arm or either leg, there was pretty much one solution and that was amputation otherwise if they didn't the wound would become infected you'd get gangrene and you would die and that happened too sometimes so a lot of amputations occurred during the war if you were shot in the middle part of the body like generally speaking if you got shot in the stomach or in the chest you were pretty much a goner there, there wasn't a whole lot they could do for you and of course, if you were shot in the head, generally speaking, the same thing happened. Obviously, there's exceptions to all these things. You read about these miraculous situations where somebody gets shot in the mouth and they still survive somehow. But that's very, very rare. And they did not have anesthesia. That, or they, they had some. I mean, it was around. It existed. There was ether. There was chloroform, primitive forms of anesthesia. But 
they typically ran out. There were just way too many uh, wounds that needed to be treated. There was many, many more than they had supplies of anesthesia. So typically speaking, you would literally bite down on a bullet or you'd bite down on a stick or piece of wood and they would just, maybe they'd give you a little whiskey to dull the pain a little bit if it was there, but uh, they would typically just saw you, saw it off, saw your leg off, saw your arm off right there, and you're usually fully conscious of it. There's a great scene in the movie. Uh, I say this all the time. People are going to start saying, oh, wait, wait, let's, how long is it going to be until he <laughs> <laughs> dude, mentions a movie? We'll make it a drinking game. You know, every time James says movie, uh, make, make it whiskey. I mean, that's appropriate for a civil war discussion. So just keep that it in mind, be. listeners. It would be and have a cigar in honor of good old general Grant and general Sherman. Um, but there's a, in the movie dances with wolves, which is one of my all time favorite movies of any type at the very beginning, it takes place during the civil war and Kevin Costner's character is just about to get his leg sawed off. And the, the surgeons are so tired that they have to go take a break and have some coffee. And he actually grabs his boot, gets up and runs away. So he does, I mean, they, you did not want to go to a hospital <laughs> in general because a lot of times the doctors did more damage than they did good. We'll, I'll let you discuss that more later. But so we talked about shattered arms and shattered legs. We talked about amputations. We talked about the lack of knowledge of antiseptics. They didn't understand that germs transmitted diseases. They didn't understand that you, you shouldn't stick your dirty hands in somebody's body trying to find a bullet or you, you shouldn't, they didn't understand the concept of keeping your hands clean. They didn't clean their medical instruments such as they were they were typically saws i usually make a joke to my students when i teach on the civil war and i say if you wanted to be a civil war doctor the first question they would say is do you know how to use a saw <laughs> <laughs> and if you said yes you got hired uh, i'm i'm exaggerating slightly but that's pretty much the, the saw was one of the most common instruments that was used by medical doctors at the time. And, and as I mentioned before, my great, great grandfather early was a s surgeon for the union. So, uh, sorry, great, great granddad. <laughs> I don't mean to, I mean, it's not that these guys were dumb. They just didn't understand. They didn't have the knowledge that we have today. And then I also just want to talk about disease in general. Even if you never got hit by a bullet or a cannonball, or a shell, or anything like that, you still had a really good chance of dying because there was so much disease going around and there was no medicine, no real modern medicine to cure it. Here's a staggering statistic, Scott, with about, well, okay, let me say this. When I was going through college, and you still see this in some books, the, the total number of people that died in the Civil War was given as 620,000 roughly. But now people are starting to say it's probably more like 750,000. And so let's take that, let's say 750,000, okay? Of those 750,000, 500,000 or half a million died of disease. Hmm. Not, I got shot and I died of my wound. No, no, no. We're talking about, I never got, you know, I never had a serious injury. I just caught uh, dysentery or I caught measles or mumps, a lot of what we call Childhood diseases today were very common in these camps. Uh, dysentery, diarrhea, all kinds of things that are cured today uh, took people down back then. And so uh, it's just amazing that for every soldier that died of wounds, two died of disease. It's just absolutely staggering to think of. So what was medicine like in general, Scott? Tell us a little about that. Tell us about uh, some of the people who were fighting against it. Well, like you said, they weren't dumb. But they had to operate under a very limited framework. It was they weren't using um, deductive logic where they had information, they had medical knowledge, and they go from there. They would use inductive, where they generally see what works and generally see what doesn't, but they might not know the why. And at this time, you really don't have bacteriology, what some people would call animolecules, if you could um, afford a newfangled microscope. Although at this time in the U.S. Uh, Harvard Medical School doesn't even have a stethoscope or microscope until after the war. Where Civil War surgeons are, uh, most had never treated a gunshot wound. Crime didn't happen really at the threat of a gun in urban areas because you didn't have handguns, or at least revolvers wouldn't be used as much. Many had never performed surgery. Many of these doctors were quacks. This is the golden age of quackery. This is the snake, literal snake oil salesman who are going around the frontier and, 
yes, your concoction might not cure anyone, but you can simply move on to the next town and maybe someone gets healed by the placebo effect. So doctors are not well trained. Some of them are quacks. They're always understaffed by surgeons. Uh, They did the best they could. But like you said, this is not emerging much out of the Middle Ages. Medicine did make some gains during the course of the war, just simply in terms of how many opportunities they had to practice it. But this time, it doesn't encompass the use of sterile dressings or antiseptic surgery or understanding sanitation or hygiene. Just one other thing of what's happening at this time. Now, there are reforms that are starting to be made. Uh, most famously is the case of Florence Nightingale. She served British soldiers in the Crimean War and came to Constantinople in the Ottoman Empire in late 1854. And her story, I think, just gives you an understanding of how much of a killer unsanitary conditions can be. And that is what Civil War soldiers on both sides absolutely lived in. So when she shows up, the hospital that she was assigned to was absolutely filthy. It's out on top of a cesspool. Uh, Patients laid in their own excrement on stretchers strewn throughout the hallways. Much like Civil War soldiers, many were dying of infections and typhoid. Uh, So what Nightingale did is she got hundreds of scrub brushes and asked the least injured patients to literally scrub every square inch of the hospital from floor to ceiling. And her work almost immediately reduced the hospital death rate by two-thirds. We really didn't have a Florence Nightingale in the Civil War. So this is a big cause of it. And people were generally aware of um, the conditions that could cause death to happen. Malaria, the word malaria is literally from Latin, mal audia, bad air. People understood that if you were in a swamp area, that's what would cause it. But they didn't really link that to mosquitoes. They thought that something about the stilted, putrid air affected your physical condition, and that's what caused it. So they would move out of that area. And that would correlate because if you move out of swamp areas, then you would also move out of a place where there are mosquitoes. But because they lack this information, this is what really uh, makes a death toll so horrific from a medical standpoint. So anyway, that's just an excursus there. But thanks for mentioning that, James, because when you think of the Civil War, don't imagine at a camp or a hospital men laying there dying because um, they have a wound and that's gushing out. Yes, that would be the case for many of them. But just as many, you would see them uh, coughing up a horrible fit or in the last stages of typhoid or malaria. That's what you would see much more at a hospital than you would of people dying from gunshot wounds, for example. Scott, let me jump in and say one thing. Uh, It's true that there wasn't a Florence Nightingale and that there wasn't one huge, gigantic or titanic figure uh, who did so much for medicine and sanitation and what but you did have quite a few smaller people i I, I mean smaller in that there it was such a bigger war than the crimean war that you had to have lots and lots of people and there were some a lot of heroes both sung and unsung on both sides i think especially i'm thinking about clara barton who later founded the american red cross she gave of her time for throughout the whole war selflessly you also had um uh, Dorothea Dix, both of them were a lot. There were just hundreds of females who volunteered as nurses. And that was kind of a new thing prior to the war. Generally speaking, nurses were male, but it, it was considered improper for women to be around these men who were undressed partially or, or sometimes completely. Uh, but these many hundreds, if not thousands, well, it was thousands of women, uh, gave their not literally gave their life. Some of them did. Some of them got sick themselves and died, but they just gave up their entire time for four years. And a lot of them didn't even get paid. And there were, of course, a lot of males too. Uh, I I think of Walt Whitman, the poet. Uh, He, during the Civil War, also volunteered as a nurse. So there were people that did try to clean up things and and, and it did help quite a bit. In fact, you had, now that I think about it, you had the U.S. Sanitary Commission. You had an entire government agency who had people that would go out in these camps and say, hey, clean up. And, you know, you might not want to drink from the same <laughs> river that you're pooping in, for example. Uh, you might want to try to build a latrine way far away from your drinking water. So, yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody understands there were lots and lots of people, some we know and some we'll never know, who who really did do a lot towards cleaning up the camps. And when you consider that, it makes it even more mind-boggling how many people still died of disease in spite of that. 
Yeah, that's a good point to mention, too, that people realize that cleanliness would lead to better conditions. But due to time, due to lack of resources, sometimes it simply right. wasn't possible. And this is something I think that can be left out in movies or even uh, historical sources where people not, might not mention how dirty the conditions were, how bad they smelled, because that was simply how life was back then. And I've heard right. a lot of historians say that if you were at back in time, the first thing that you would notice that was different was the smell. Ugh, yeah. I can't imagine. Ugh. It's a very easy thing to take for granted, but you could imagine unsanitary conditions on almost any site. So a lot to say to that, but that's, that's a good thing to underline. So with that in mind, let's go into Chancellorsville. So our new general, Hooker, yes, how does he stack up to our other generals who have big words but do not match them with actions? Well, he had a lot of promise. Uh, they didn't pick him because he was a failure. <laughs> they, uh, he had been a Corps commander. He had done very, very well as a Corps commander. He'd fought bravely at Antietam. He'd fought at Fredericksburg. Hooker was a very different man than Burnside. He he was kind of a wild man. He loved drink. He he was a drinker. He loved women. In fact, uh, I always joke to my students. I say, so sideburns were named after Burnside, but I'm not going to talk about what was named <laughs> after General Hooker. Um, and there was a joke at the time that actually the, the term Hooker came from his name, but that's actually not correct. The term Hooker for a prostitute had been around much earlier, but. They said, yeah, that's a good name for this guy. Uh, let's just say his his uh, staff headquarters were a fun place to be. It was just a party all the time. But hard fighter, <laughs> very convivial. He was uh, popular with the men. And unlike Burnside, he was an excellent organizer. We saw last episode how Burnside let the logistical and organizational state of the Army go to pot. Well, Hooker whipped it back into shape. He raised morale. The deserters started coming back. He said he had the best army on the planet, and he probably was correct. But he was a little bit of a bragger, like some of our other generals we've seen. He was a great egotist. He said he made a bunch of bold pronouncements. He said it wasn't a question of whether he would capture Richmond. It's a question of when. And then he also said, he says, I hope God would have mercy on Robert E. Lee because I will not have any mercy on him. Again, <laughs> do, you, do you feel the famous last words coming on there? Yeah, it sounds like a tagline on a movie trailer. Exactly. And Lincoln, of course, Lincoln was wise and he understood <laughs> that, that things didn't always go well, especially when you started running your mouth like that. Lincoln said, the hen is the wisest of all of God's creatures because she never cackles until the egg is laid. <laughs> so, a hen is smarter than Hooker, he's implying, because at least a hen waits till she has the egg before she cackles. Hooker hasn't done anything yet, and he's already cackling. And he told uh, Hooker that Lee's army, not Richmond, was the target. Doesn't do any good to go capture the city if Lee's still running around. All right, Hooker has a total of 120,000 troops, big army that he'd inherited from McClellan and Burnside. Lee only has about 60,000. And in fact, some of Lee's army is not even there. They're, they're not, they have been sent off to the west to forage and to look for food because they're starting to run out of food. Longstreet's uh, corps was out in particular. Hooker decided he'd start out by sending his cavalry on a raid behind Lee to cut off Lee's communication with Richmond. And then he would leave about 40,000 troops in front of Lee near Fredericksburg. So let's do the mental map thing again. They're still, they're not far from the Fredericksburg battle site. Hooker is camped on the east side of the Rappahannock River. So again, it's the same mental map as we started out, but there's going to be one major difference. So you've got the, the river running from north to south, roughly. The Federals or the Union that is, Hooker's army is on the right side or the east side of the river, and Lee is on the other side. Uh, Lee is spread out. Part of his army is near the town of Fredericksburg, not in it. And Hooker wants to put some people, he's going to divide his army. He's going to put some and cross into Fredericksburg again and put some more pressure on the Confederates following the same route that Burnside did. But this time he's going to go way around Lee's left. So he's going to go north and then come back south and try to come in behind Lee and cut him off. Sounds like a good plan. Uh, let's see if it works. He's going to try to make Lee retreat. All right. What do you think, Scott? Is it going to work? 
Another classic Napoleonic flanking maneuver. So let's see if it happens. No one has really convinced. Stonewall Jackson, I think, can use a cavalry pretty well, from what I can tell, better than anyone else. Union side, not seeing a lot of promise. So, eh. Jackson didn't even need cavalry. He just his, he made his men march so fast that they became human cavalry or foot cavalry, as they called them. But you had Jeb Stuart, who was the great Confederate cavalry commander at the time. But let's see what happens. All right. So Hooker marches his men way. And, and on, on your mental map, they're going up on the map or north. And then they turn around, they come back and they're trying to come in behind Lee. He actually succeeds. He gets them around Lee's left. And he arrives at an old inn called Chancellorsville. Surprise, surprise. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a town even. It's just one great big house that's used as an inn or a bed and breakfast, we would say today. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, from their deep origins to our present epoch. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. I invite you to come along for the ride. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Hello, this is Dr. Doug Grotheis, host of Truth Tribe, where we seek the truth through reason and evidence about what matters most. And we are not tribal since truth is for everyone. Please join me at the Truth Tribe as I discuss the reasons for Christian faith, the Christian worldview, and moral issues such as abortion and gender ideology. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Truth Tribe on your favorite podcast app. So Lee now has federal troops in front of him uh, in Fredericksburg, the, the town, and he's also got some behind him off to the west. Hooker thought Lee would retreat, exposing his army to attack, or he would have to turn around and fight Lee, in which case uh, Lee would get trounced, probably. That's what Hooker thought anyway. But Lee had a way of not doing what his opponent wanted him to. <laughs> it's like when I play chess, sometimes I think, well... If I do this, my opponent will do this, and I'll have him. And then I realize, oh, there was another option that I didn't even see. <laughs> Lee was a master military uh, chess player, if you will. I don't mean he literally played chess. He may have. But he, he knew how to move the pieces around on the, on the real live battlefield to confound his enemies. And Lee does something which is really, really gutsy. And it violates a maxim of military planning, and that is... One of the fundamental rules, at least at this time, and it's probably still true today, it seems very logical, is if you are outnumbered, you never divide your army. Okay, If, you're, if you've got 60,000, you're being hit by 120,000, you want to split your guys up. You want to keep them all together. But uh, Lee doesn't like to follow the rules. <laughs> Lee is kind of like, like Captain Kirk, you know, in the Kobayashi Maru. He, he rewrites the rules. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> reprograms the, the situation. So so what Lee does is he does, he's going to split his army. He leaves 10,000 troops in Fredericksburg to uh, hold up the Federals that were over there, and they were under my personal favorite Confederate general, General Jubal Early. <laughs> so Early has got 10,000 in Fredericksburg or behind Fredericksburg trying to hold off the, the Federals over there. On the other side, the west side, he... Lee puts his army in a place called the wilderness. And the wilderness is exactly what you would think. And I've been there and it is still a wilderness. I can't, it was probably even more so back then. The wilderness had a lot of tall trees, but it had a lot of second growth. It was a place where there'd been a lot of trees cut down to feed a nearby factory uh, because you trees to start a fire to, to run the forges, right? So 
Um, a lot of trees have been cut down and they'd been replaced by scrub brushes and saplings and shorter and vines and all kinds of undergrowth. So, so it was very hard to walk through, let alone move an army through. Lee knew that if he could force Hooker to come in and fight him in this wilderness, that that would neutralize a lot of the Federal's advantages. Their numerical superiority wouldn't really help because they just can't, they can't move all those guys. They can only move a few through at a time through this wilderness. And artillery is useless too because you can't fire cannons if you can't see anything, right? So that's Lee's master strategy is he's going to use the terrain, which he knew well, to his advantage. All right, on March, I'm sorry, May 1st, we're into the spring now, Hooker orders the army to march a few miles east to get out of the wilderness, but Lee sends Stonewall Jackson's corps around there, and when, Lee, when Hooker finds out that Jackson is there, he just kind of freaks. He freezes up, and he immediately retreats back to Chancellorsville. And this was a huge mistake. Now he's back at, uh, he should have gotten out of the wilderness, but now he's going to be stuck in the wilderness He'd lost his nerve. Hooker just got spooked by Jackson. And he later said, uh, to tell the truth, I just lost confidence in Joe Hooker. Speaking in the third person somehow absolves himself from. <laughs> yeah, like it's this other guy that I, I did. It wasn't me. It was it was this other me or something. I don't know. Yeah. So Hooker really, uh, if you lose your confidence, you might as well pack it up and go home. You've already lost before you've even started. All right. So. Lee, it's like Lee sensed this. Lee almost had the ability to read his opponent's mind. I mean, I'm sure he literally didn't, could not read their minds, but he just could sense what they were thinking a lot of the time. Lee splits his army again. He's already split it into two pieces, and now he splits it into three. And he sends Stonewall Jackson around Hooker's right. Okay, So instead of Hooker doing the flanking movement that you talked about and that I talked about earlier, now Jackson's going to go around Hooker's right, and he's going to get back behind Hooker and surprise, here we are. Uh, come out, he's going through a little trail through the wilderness. There were some locals who helped the Confederates find a way to get through the wilderness quickly. Jackson is famous for his use of speed. And so with 14,000 men in the main body of, well, I guess it's kind of the main body, Lee is holding Hooker's attention. So Hooker's looking ahead and he sees all these trees and all this smoke and he realizes Lee is there. But he doesn't realize that there's 28,000 more coming around his right. Um, Jackson and his army shows up. They surprise Hooker and, and the Federals. They push the Federals back. Jackson, the day is coming to an end. The Confederate attack is starting to stall out, and Jackson wants to keep it going. He wants to preserve the momentum. So he personally rides out in the front of his army. And he's trying to look around. He's got his staff with him. There, he's trying to figure out how can we best continue this and keep pushing forward and maybe destroy the Federals. But by this time, it's dark, and Jackson accidentally rides into the line of fire of a Confederate regiment. They thought they were firing at the enemy, but they were actually firing at Jackson. And Jackson was hit, and he was critically wounded. And when he went down, the Confederate attack lost its steam. They put him on a stretcher and they ran him back to the rear. And at one point, there was a there was some um, artillery that went off and they dropped Jackson on the ground. Poor guy, just <laughs> hard ground. And they put him back on. They got him back to a hospital. Um, but Jackson's left arm had to be amputated. So Jackson is out of the fight. Great loss for the Confederates. The Confederates had completely surprised and kicked some serious Union rear, but they lost Jackson. And when Lee heard about this, he said, he has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right. Yeah, I think people interested in counterfactual history, a lot of them would point to Jackson disappearing from this battle and then other ones as being a critical moment in the Civil War. Oh, it absolutely is. I mean, we, we have no idea, of course, but it sure couldn't have hurt the Confederates to have had Jackson uh, for the rest of the war. He didn't always do a great job when he was in command himself, but but who knows? Um, they, anyway, there's no doubt that it was a great blow to the Confederates. All right, so the next day comes around. It's now May 3rd, and the Confederate wings reunite. So Jack, the, the force that had been led by Jackson, he's replaced temporarily by Jeb Stuart, actually by A.P. Hill, and Hill was wounded, and so Stuart takes over. Stuart's a cavalry commander, but for now he's commanding infantry. 
He reunites with Lee's main body, uh, but Hooker doesn't do anything. He's just, he's stunned. It's like he's in a, a daze. In fact, um, he was watching the fighting from the Chancellor House, which is the inn that Chancellorsville is named for. And while he was standing on the porch watching, a Confederate shell split a pillar that he was leaning against. Okay. So he's leaning against this pillar and all of a sudden it gets hit by a Confederate shell. He's not wounded, but he's knocked senseless. And he was groggy for the rest of the day. And people said, uh, sir, should you perhaps hand command over to someone else? And he said, no, 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 I'm going to stay in command. He should have handed it over because he was even worse. I mean, he was already pretty much spooked and freaked out, but now he's physically unable to do his job, but he won't give it up. He, abandoned, he orders the army to abandon a hilltop. And this allows Confederate army to fire down on his troops. He refuses to send reinforcements when they're needed. The Union commander in front of Fredericksburg, who was uh, John Sedgwick, we'll talk about him more later. Sedgwick had pushed the Confederates out of Fredericksburg. I will say my, my hero, General Early, he did fight them off a couple times, but they were just outnumbered. <laughs> and so Early is driven out of Fredericksburg. Sedgwick, which this is the other part of the Union Army, he's coming in and closing in on Chancellorsville. Lee, once again, this is the third time this has happened. He divides his army. He leaves 25,000 men in front of Hooker. He realizes Hooker's not going to do anything, so we'll just leave a token force there to make sure he doesn't get any ideas. And then he sends the rest over to deal with Sedgwick. On May 3rd and 4th, Lee defeats Sedgwick's forces at another battle called Salem Church. And finally, on the 6th, the Federals once again pack it up and leave. They give up, they retreat, they go back across the river, and the battle ends. So another uh, complete Confederate victory and a complete Union disaster. This is an example, uh, not to go back to Napoleon again, but these generals keep doing it, so I can't help but do so also. Hey, listener, every time Scott mentions Napoleon, take a drink. <laughs> yeah, this is another thing in the whiskey. I mean, you mentioned movies. I mentioned Napoleon. Um, not if you're driving. <laughs> right. It's be, th This tactic of leaving an inferior force behind, splitting up your inferior force, and then the, the smaller rump force that was – left behind is to occupy the main force and then you use the others to the other force to flank lee is doing this over and over again successfully and i think this is an incredible lost opportunity we blame mcclellan in the peninsula campaign but in chancellorsville um hooker does nothing when his forces outnumber lee's in chancellorsville by four to one so yeah he could have trapped lee's army between his and sedgwick's troops uh, but yeah, he kept missing these opportunities yeah. again. Overall, it's more like two to one, but in certain parts at certain times, you know, there would be a piece of the Confederate army that was outnumbered three or four to one, no doubt about that. Um, and again, just, it's just amazing that it's yet another union disaster. Um, it's interesting that in the movie Glory, another one of my favorite movies, and there's another movie, so, you know, salud, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Zivjeli, as they say in Serbia, but um, take a drink. The There's a part where this one officer says, all oh, the top brass are all up in Washington planning the next disaster. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a funny line, but sad, because it, you just start to think, is there anybody other than Grant and, and Sherman that can command an army. Is there anybody in the East that, that can command an army correctly? And the answer is so far, nobody. Uh, so here's the outcome of this battle, this key battle, uh, 17,000 federal casualties, 13,000 Confederates. So once again, Robert E. Lee with the inferior force outnumbered overall two to one, nevertheless deals out more casualties than he takes. Uh, but, one of those 13,000 was extremely, extremely important, as we mentioned, Stonewall Jackson. Jackson, after his arm is amputated, he falls ill with pneumonia. And right before he dies on the 10th, uh, I guess I should say he dies. On the, <laughs> but his final words were, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. And interestingly enough, fun fact, his arm was buried in a separate location from where his body was eventually buried. Sounds like a holy relic. 
Uh, it is to a lot of Southerners for yeah, many I'd decades. Yeah. You can uh, you can go. There's a monument uh, or a marker that shows where his arm was buried. I think I, I it's been a while since I've prepared this lesson and I've forgotten, but I believe that they were reunited perhaps later. I don't know. I think that it's kind of weird, kind of sick, but they, I think they dug up the arm and put it with the body. Anyway, um, all of this is shown in the, the battle. I mean, the movie Gods in general. So again, I, I recommend it with an asterisk by there. Uh, if get gods and generals and watch it, but be be ready to fast forward through some of the boring and cheesy parts. The battles are the best parts, in my opinion. Uh, it has to do a lot with Jackson and Lee. Okay, so Jackson is dead. Major blow to the Confederacy, and this battle is considered Lee's masterpiece. Lee's reputation as a military genius was sealed. Lee seemed unbeatable. Lee. In his personal life, he was not a gambler. He didn't play dice or cards. He was a very religious man. But on the battlefield, he was a gambler. And it's, you know, not to get too much into counterfactuals, but it's kind of interesting that you think about this. If Lee had failed, we would be saying right now, well, Lee did something totally stupid. <laughs> right. Think about it, Scott. It's funny because what, whenever somebody in history gambles like this, we say, oh, they're a genius if it works. But if it doesn't work, uh, we say, well, that was the dumbest thing. Everybody knows you don't divide your army in the face of a superior opponent, right? Exactly, uh, yeah. If, you had, if, if you'd had somebody with more calmness, more presence of mind than Hooker, like, again, I hate to keep bringing up Grant, but um, eventually we are going to bring him over. We're going to bring him over to the East. But uh, he's busy right now in the West, sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, if you had a Grant who never, ever got rattled about anything, this would have, I think, gone completely differently, or at least it could have. It, it was likely to have. Um, it's like in a football game, you know, you throw a Hail Mary pass or you do some trick play. If it works, you say, oh, that coach is a genius. But um, if it fails, you think, well, that coach is an idiot. You shouldn't have done something that risky and that stupid. I guess football, I keep bringing up football, so that's another drinking subject. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just turn ourselves into a drinking game. Over a long enough period of time, the chances of something becoming a drinking game uh, approaches one, but a, a vertical <laughs> isotope, as it were. I um, guess we all come back to our favorite themes over and over, don't we? Well, that is a good point you mentioned, that this very well could have gone the other way, but um, the the utter contingency of the success of this battle and the contingency of Lee's tactics, I think, are something useful to point out. Um, and once um, Stonewall uh, or once Stonewall Jackson exits the scene, they don't work as well. I think. Would you say that this sort of represents the height of the Confederacy? I think it probably does. It's the high water mark militarily of the Army of Northern Virginia, and as far as the Confederacy as a whole. Um, yeah, perhaps you could also argue that get well. Yeah, I guess you could, because this is going to give Lee the confidence to once again. Sorry to give away the surprise listeners, but <laughs> <laughs> most of you will probably already know that not long after this, Lee's going to go into the north one more time and we'll have the Battle of Gettysburg, which we'll talk about uh, fairly soon. Uh, so, yeah, I guess you could say I, I think Lee and the Confederate Army after this battle, they develop a sense of uh what's the word this like in, in invincibility like nothing we never lose no matter what we do we win and robert e lee no matter how bad things are going if we're outnumbered two to one three to one doesn't matter lee's gonna pull a rabbit out of his hat and we're gonna win you know it's like when you when you go to the movies there's a movie again but when you go to like a james bond movie or something and james bond is tied up and they're about to drop him into the ocean or or they're gonna you know kill him you know, James Bond always gets out of it. He always wins in the end. And so I think in a similar fashion, people begin to say, well, Lee, Lee always wins. He, he just can't lose. And it doesn't matter who the commander is. It doesn't matter how many, uh, the, the, who, who the union commander is. It doesn't matter how many union troops Lee's going to pull it out somehow. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico from their deep origins to our present epoch. 
Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. I invite you to come along for the ride. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East, equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafund.com to listen and subscribe. And that's, I think, a factor, too, that partly Lee's tactics explain the victory here. But another important factor, I think, is the synergy between Lee and Jackson that he had. Oh, yeah. They work together beautifully. And uh, sorry to interrupt, but I'll I'll let you finish. But I'll just say that there's never going to be another partnership on the Confederate side that functions as effectively and has a good relationship as we see we have seen between Lee and Jackson. Right. And I think part of the reason is that um, Lee's orders could be a bit more ambiguous than Grant's, which, depending on the officer who had to execute them, could be good or bad. For Jackson, it's great yeah. because he's so competent that he can use those orders, um, but he can operate within flexibility to make those choices that he needs to and move quickly. If you have uh, people below you who are not so quick on their feet or they don't think as independently and they can execute very specifically, then that does not work as well. So yeah, that's that that's something that becomes a problem. And OK, take another shot at Napoleon, where at the end of his career, his class of officers, many of them were soldiers who had risen through the ranks that may have been good soldiers, but not necessarily good officers don't fit his style as well as officers earlier in his career who could operate better within this realm of flexibility. So Uh the flanking maneuvers that Jackson employs aren't to be repeated as dramatically in the future. Um, Another problem, too, you mentioned the sense of inevitability, this um, blessing of God that has descended on the Confederacy, like France in the Hundred Years' Uh War with Joan of Arc, where the problem is that After Jackson's death, there's not anyone forceful enough uh, to convince Lee of the necessity to be much more careful about preserving his most precious non-renewable resource of his army and to not to be fight a much more defensive battle and flank never frontally assault superior forces. So you don't have those other voices um, to kind of to control some of his impulses that could be expressed in negative ways. So this yeah, relationship Lee, between the two is critical, critical too. Lee is very quickly going to learn that he actually does not always win automatically just because he's Robert E. Lee. And, and I don't think it was an ego trip on his part. I think his, he had more, it was more his faith in the men, but these guys are just regular human beings. They, they've done amazing things so far, but they, they don't always win there. It is, it is possible for them to lose. They can't, do superhuman uh, <laughs> things, you know, so that's going to become apparent at Gettysburg. And the thing about the orders, I like what you said too. Lee could sometimes be a little vague, but he didn't have to be super specific for Jackson. He could tell Jackson, he could give him a vague order and give him leeway. And Jackson knew exactly what needed to be done. Jackson knew what he meant. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he, he didn't have to be specific with Jackson, but we're going to see Jackson's going to be replaced by a uh, couple of guys who are not not anywhere near as talented as he is on the battlefield. And then Lee's going to, at Gettysburg, Lee's going to give some ambiguous orders. Uh, in fact, he's going to say, take this hill if you see it practicable. And Jackson, of course, would have said, heck yeah, man, I'm taking it. 
Let me add him. Uh, but this other person that's going to replace Jackson is not going to be so aggressive and so bold. And he's going to say, well, sorry, it wasn't practicable, at least not in my opinion. Anyway, let's let's move on and wrap it up here. Uh, one other theme that we've we've touched upon and we're, I want to stress it again and we're going to keep I'm going to keep hammering it. We saw that Lee dished out way more casualties than the Confederates took. There were 17,000 Federals that were either killed, wounded, or captured, or lost, 13,000 Confederates. But every time we see those numbers, we have to realize that that Confederate percentage of the original army is a much bigger percentage than the Union percentage. I, I believe you said something about this either in our last episode or earlier in this one, but that 13,000, you look at that and you say, well, yeah, that's less than the Federals, but it's a greater percentage. Lee lost 23% of his army. Remember that he started with 60,000, 13,000, they're out of it now. They're either dead or, or wounded. And so he's down to just uh, 47,000. And he lost 13 brigade commanders. You know, you did not want to be a general or a colonel back in these days <laughs> and because you, you, could, you were at least as likely to be shot as a private if not even more, because sharpshooters would pick you off and you, you had to ride around on a horse, waving a sword or waving your hat, rallying the troops. And so you were a sitting duck or a riding duck, <laughs> if I will. You're not really literally sitting. The northern public is devastated. Lincoln says, my God, my God, what will the country say? Yeah, one disaster after another for Lincoln. So you want things to, to turn up. And uh, just one book, I think uh, this is a uh, pitch, but there's a wonderful book called uh, Lincoln's Melancholy by Joshua Shank that looks psychologically at Lincoln and sees that uh, he suffered with depression throughout his life. But his thesis is that his bouts of melancholy and Lincoln's decades long struggle to overcome it gave him the fortitude to be able to weather disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. And to realize, okay, I've I've been failed three times in a row by incompetent generals, but to not give up, to not be dispirited, but be forthright and hope that things will turn around. So understanding sort of what created Lincoln's medal, I think that's an excellent book and I would recommend. But so James, for the next episode, where does the Civil War take us? Well, we're gonna go back out west. We really could do either one. We could go up to Gettysburg, which takes place only a couple months after this battle. Uh, but I, we haven't been out West for a while, so I want to go and see what's been going on, uh, get caught up in the West. And we're going to look at Grant as he's going to march down and try to take the very last Confederate stronghold or the second to last technically, but the last major Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi. And that is the city of Vicksburg. Excellent. We will see you then. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles in the Civil War podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show in the podcast player of your choice and leave us a rating and a review. This helps us grow and reach new listeners. You can also find maps of the battle sites, show notes each episode, and plenty of other history info by going to keybattlesinthecivilwar.com.